are the end of day one. Our final talk, something that I've been super excited to hear about. Uh, but before we get to that, again, if you haven't gotten a t-shirt, head out to the AppSec Village website. You can pick up a shirt there. Um, and let's give a big thumbs up to everybody who helped to put this on this year. This is fantastic. Uh, definitely want to thank everyone. Uh, the next speaker, Mario Reyes, is going to talk about threat modeling the Death Star, which what a better model that can we use, right? Mario is a software developer with 10 years of experience in four different countries. His expertise involves security, DevOps, and agile practices. Mario helps teams to deliver value quickly while keeping applications, infrastructure, and data safe. Um, with that, let's welcome Mario to the stage. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk, Try the Modeling the Death Star. My name is Mario. I have been a software developer for over 10 years, and recently I have moved to be a full time security engineer two or three years ago. And today, um, nowadays, I'm a software engineer at Canva. Today, I want to talk about thread modeling. And trend modeling is a subject that I feel is very important and is very dear to my heart for many different reasons. But the main reason is a reason that was shown on the State of DevOps report from last year. So the State of DevOps report is a report um, done by Puppet and different other companies where they look, uh, survive different companies and they try to get information about how efficient they are in the DevOps world. And one of the things they look at is security. And they have like looking at all different companies of all different sizes is the most effective way to improve your secure posture is to do security um, collaborative thread models with the security team and the development teams. That's really, really important um, to improve your secure posture. And that's what I have seen in my experience as well as a security engineer. Every time I introduce thread modeling, to a company or to a team, I could see the benefits of it very quickly, like the improve of the secure posture. But before we're gonna jump in about and go more in advanced details about thread modeling, I want to talk a little bit what the definition is, right? And if you look, if you try to Google it, you're gonna see like many different definitions, but this one I like the best, is that thread modeling is a process to identify Enumerate threats. That's what trend modeling. That's what trend modeling is at the end of the day, right? And that makes a lot of sense for security people. But then when you try to go to not secure people or not trend modeling nerds, <laughs> they don't get very impressed, right? It's a very dry concept. It's a very uh, abstract concept, and it's really hard to engage people who are not from security actually understand and get involved with thread modeling. And that's a hard situation, isn't it? Like where you have thread modeling brings so much benefits to the organization, but on the other hand, it's really hard to get other people to do it. And that was my position a few years ago and tried to introduce thread modeling in a company. And I really knew that like thread modeling is quite, quite important. But I also knew that's not very engaging at all. So I was trying to find a balance where I could reap the benefits of trend modeling while make sure people were uh, motivated enough to engage and participate in the process. It's not only more of one checkbox that you need to do at the end of the day, right? Anyway, then I come up with a list of requirements. And what the requirements are. The requirements are something like I felt if there wasn't there for the trend modeling process, they wouldn't be very successful. I, do, I wouldn't think that actually is something that's uh, valuable to the company. And I come up with three different requirements, right? Um, one is it needs to be engaging. Trend modeling definitely needs to be engaging. It shouldn't be one, another boring meeting people need to attend. It should be something like more um, fun and more engaging so people can go and have a good time, at least um, in, the, in the thread modeling session. It needs to be highly collaborative. Again, like the magic of the thread modeling happens when you get the security team doing it and the development team doing it as well together and like uh, collaborating to get this process done. 
uh, it's not like a process for me. It was like a no-go. What process where the security team did it, uh, behind the scenes and they just return a report to the development teams. Definitely like wasn't something I wanted to do it. And finally, it needs to be valuable for everyone. And it sounds like a bit silly, but it's very easy for people to think like I'm doing the strat modeling just to, like to make sure the security team's happy and then I could do my stuff. Um, that's not the idea that I want to do for the thread modeling. I want something that if people are participating, collaborating, they could get something out of it. They could like understand the process and see the value of it and then do it again and again, not only because security team wants to have the software more secure, because they also see value and they also want to get their software more secure. And then I look at very different methodologies. I look at Stride, I look at Pasta, I look at many others. But the software methodology that I like the most is Attack Trace. I think that resonates well with me, my experience, and resonates very well with the, comp the teams and companies I have worked for uh, where I introduced that. Uh, I really like the way, to see, because it's very simple and it's very easy to do it. That doesn't mean it's the best uh, methodology for everyone. Like um, different people have different styles, different companies have different cultures. You might find just something different for yourself. But for me, that was very like when I saw the tech trees, I really understood the concept. They really uh, could see that being rolled out to the company. But before I actually tried to do the rollout for the company, I did a pilot first. I chose like a few selected teams. They were doing some interesting work and they were trying to model what a great value at that phase of the work. And with that, I talked to them, I did some pilots, I did a few trend models, and then I did a survey at the end of it to see what people think about the, the process. And I really asked them to be very honest because if it wasn't working for them, chances are it wouldn't work for other people in the company, so it wouldn't be successful and we should just like start from scratch again rather than try to roll out that process. And the numbers I got were very positive, let's say this. 80% of developers found like um, useful, they found valuable, and they would participate again. And for me, the participated again was the like ultimate metric. If they would participate again, it's because I, I hit the three requirements. They saw value in it, it was collaborative, and was engaging, right? And they see value, they, they actually saw value for them, and they wanted to do it again. Um, so that makes me like made me feel confident and then I did roll out that to the rest of the company. Uh, and I'm going to want to talk about that, how, what's the process I did roll out, but I want to use Star Wars for that. Um, because again, trade modeling is very dry, it's a very um, abstract concept. So uh, I always try to get different ways to make trade modeling a bit more engaging. And Star Wars is one of the funnest ways that I have seen so far. So. Let's start with Star Wars. And that story starts with yourself in the audience watching this at, at this point, um, where you are the new CSO of the Galactic Empire, Chief Security Officer. Well done. You start as a low level stormtrooper fighting the trenches uh, against the rebellion and you made all your way to the top. Now you're a Chief Security Officer. Well, well done. But not every team likes perfect, isn't it? That guy now, he's our new boss. Yeah, and how can I say this? He's a very different style of leadership. This whole thing, you know, you learn about today, blameless culture or servant leadership. It's definitely not something he believes in. He's more like an old school kind of guy. He really thinks like high accountability is the way moving forward. But that's okay, right? Like everybody had like some problematic boss at, at some point in their careers. And I'm pretty sure you can like work around the guy. And you as being like a CSO, you start to look at the crown jewels of, of the empire, right? What's the most important assets and what do you need to protect first before everything else? And the answer was very easy and very big as well. The answer was the Death Star. It's the most expensive project in the whole Galactic Empire. It's cost us around like two trillion credits. It's been 20 years in the making. It's the biggest weapon of the galaxy. 
and like a major uh, strategic asset for the Galactic Empire. So definitely, that's the way you need to. Uh, that's the asset you need to focus on. However, is a project that's been like a, as any waterfall project. <laughs> They had like over budget and overdue and the business not happy with it and the business wanted like to release that as quickly as they can to production it's been like delay and delay and delay for over too many years. So your boss and the emperor, they're not very happy. But that's fine. You can work with that. You're a professional, right? Okay, so you identify already what you need to protect. That's a dead start. That's a good first step. But you need to have some sort of understanding what kind of adversaries are going to happen, like what kind of uh, attackers are going to happen. And you use a simple exercise called like evil personas. So the Galactic Empire has been attacked for too many uh, years already. So you kind of know exactly what kind of attackers attacker, uh, the Empire can have. So let's talk about it because we need to protect the Death Star against them. And the first one is very is very interesting. Is Jar Jar Binks, right? Like Jar Jar Binks just represents a class of attackers where they uh, don't know very well what they are doing. Um, they don't have too many resources. They also very competitive, so they keep in like trying to show their, his, uh, their colleagues how good they are. Um, sometimes it can be annoying for the Empire, but honestly, when it comes to the Death Star. They are not very important personas. So although it's good to listen them, to list them, but um, it's not very good like for the um, for your trend modeling for the Death Star. So we just move to the next persona. Now we're gonna talk about um, Han Solo, right? And Han Solo is a very interesting persona because Han Solo has a lot more expertise. Han Solo um, knows what they're doing, like um, and any other boat hunters, they know what they're doing. Um, they have more resources as well. They have more their own ship. They might have like um, different weapons. But then again, they are there for the money and they don't organize themselves very well. Boat hunters are very competitive as well. They keep trying to go to the easy prey and get some easy money, but they don't try anything too big or anything like that. For when it comes to the Death Star, it can be annoying, but on the other hand, like um, they're probably not a big threat as well. But these people, these people can be problematic, right? Jedi's first, their expertise it's huge. Well, not only because they have been training for like many many years, but because like they have magic in their favor. Right? Like, they use, how can you defend against magic? If you have a guard and they just like, oh, you didn't see me or whatever, it's really, really hard to defend against them. Lucky you, it seems your boss managed to kill most of them like years and years ago. And the ones that are like out there, they're probably like hidden and they are not much of a threat anyway. So although you list them as a threat, um, because they're very unlikely to show up, and uh, it's very hard to protect against these people. You also don't focus them very much. Uh, you tr trust like your boss did a very good job and eliminated them. Then start talking about like more interesting personas when it comes to the Death Star. And here we talk about like insider threat. But honestly, uh, insider threats should be many different personas because the Empire has many different levels, uh, ranking levels, right? A uh, stormtrooper that's inside the threat is not as dangerous as a C level executive like yourself becoming inside the threat, right? Um, regardless of the position, though, they have been training, uh, trained by the Galactic Empire, right? So they have a strong training, training, and they know uh, what they need to do. They are uh, they are very good at what they do. Um, they might have like again resources a bit of an interesting thing, if you're a strong trooper, you don't have much money, but you are still live as active like yourself, they have lots of money, lots of resources. But regardless, again, of their position, they organize themselves pretty well. I, I, like, the Galactic Empire is a military organization. So they organize all the inside the threats, they can like join terrorist groups, they can form their own terrorist groups. Uh, so they can become a problem because they organize themselves very well, even if they're at a low level. Stormtrooper. 
but the most important persona for the Death Star is Princess Leia, right? Princess Leia is the, represents the rebellion. And rebellion, as you all well know, is a terrorist organization trying like uh, bring trouble to the Galactic Empire, where the Empire is just trying to like make the galaxy stable, you know? A bit of order here and there. But um, although they are a terrorist organization, they have lots of expertise. They have pilots, they have diplomats, they have spies. And they are very good. They can sometimes go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Galactic Empire. So they do have a lot of expertise. Even for like a um, terrorist organization, they have lots of resources. You, you, you're not quite sure where they get the money from, but they do get a lot of, uh, they have lots of money. They have like a small army, they have ships, they have bases across the galaxy. So they have like lots of resources. And for a terrorist organization, they organize themselves pretty well. They have become like a major pain, pain for the Galactic Empire in the last few years. Sometimes shut down like um, empire operations or shut down entire armies. So definitely Princess Leia is your like most um, important persona and the one you need to look after. Cool. So that's the summary of your personas, right? From Skip Kitty, going to Bot Hunter, Inside the Threat, Jedi's, and even like Princess Leia, the Rebellion. Now going back a little bit to the real world, um, personas, if you like, um, want to do that in your own organization, if you're a large organization, it shouldn't be very hard for you because have your organization probably has been attacked before. So you just talk to the security team in your, in your company, the ones that have, who look more incident response, they might have like an idea of kind of, of attackers you have. If you're on the other hand, like working for a smaller company, you might try to look at other websites and find like um, places where they define generic attackers. You start with them and then as you grow, as you scale and then have like real attacks, you can like tweak your personas as you go. But it's important to have like a kind of uh, understanding of the attackers are and not keep only on the abstract level of uh, an imaginable attacker. Cool. So now you have the asset that's a Death Star. You have the personas. So now it's timing to build the attack tree. And the first thing you need to do is get the right people in the room. I remember when my first slides was talking about like how threat modeling should be collaborative uh, exercise and everybody should participate together. So that's what you try to do. You try to get everybody inside the room so you could uh, run the exercise. You got the Dev Star designers and architects. You got your own team. You took so much trouble <laughs> to go through that because imagine it's really hard already to um, go into the time zones and book everybody uh, in, in the same time when you're across the galaxy where time zones are not even the thing. But somehow you manage. You put everyone in the room. You even got like um, uh, Darth Vader to do an introduction for your, uh, for for the meeting, to give some motivation for people, you know, like the kind of C-level introduction. And then you start to run the attack tree session. And the attack tree session starts like um, with the root node, is kind of the attacker goal, right? What the attacker wants to do against your asset. And you could look at very different kind of attacks. For example, if you look, um, and Han Solo uh, and, and Bounty Hunter, when he looks at Death Star, he's probably like trying to make some money out of it. He might steal some weapons, he might steal food, I don't know. They might have like steal a lot of stuff. But then you need to look and focus on what, what's most damaging for the Galactic Empire. Even if Han Solo manages to steal a bunch of weapons or a bunch of food, that really doesn't impact very much the Galactic Empire. It's annoying for sure, but it's not a, a much of a bigger problem. So in you come up with two different like uh, attacker goals. They are very, uh, if the um, attacker managed to accomplish this, it can be really damaging for the Galactic Empire. So you're gonna focus on that one. And if, and there are two kinds of goals that you need to, to look at. Is um, take control of the Death Star or take Death Star out of action. And take control of the Death Star 
it will be really, really bad. Imagine like going to 20 years of project, release that to production just for some kind of attacker, get that weapon from you and use against the empire. It would be terrible. But as well, it would be very unlikely for the kind of attackers you have because none of them have the resources to actually managing uh, a, star, um, a ship like uh, the Death Star. You need to have like 1 million crew inside the Death Star so to, to, to manage the whole thing. You need to have like a very sp specific expertise and there's lots of proprietary technology. So even Princess Leia wouldn't be able to take Death Star out of the Galactic Empire and use it against the Empire. But they definitely, definitely can look at the, take this Death Star out of action. That's probably what would be the first goal. Is as soon as they know about the, the Death Star, they try to take it out of action and take this advantage that the Galactic Empire is building out of the game, right? So we're gonna focus on that, and we're also gonna focus on Princess Leia as a persona, because she's probably she's probably the one who can actually accomplish this. Cool. So we chose that take Death Star out of action. Now we need to think about uh, how would you try to, to do this, right? Um, how would you accomplish the, take the start of action? So that's where the collaboration um, and the magic happens. The security team throws some ideas, the developers throw other ideas, and then you try to figure out like which one of these nodes are more likely to happen. And to get F when you got everybody in the room, there are two kind of nodes that um, show up. They're really important and then they're more likely to happen. One is disable the Death Star. Now, I'm not talking about like a 15 minutes disablement or maybe turn off the power for 15 minutes or something like that. I'm talking about like some sort of disablement that is so dangerous, it's so problematic that you probably the Death Star is not usable anymore. You need to rebuild the Death Star from scratch so you can disable, so you can re-enable again. So it's kind of disablement where it's probably better just create another one rather than fix it. Same like you break your iPhone screen, for example, it's so expensive, they're most likely just buy a new one. And the other one is destroy the Death Star. Literally destroy the, the whole thing, uh, exploding pieces or whatever. So that the two main ways you can take Death Star out of action. So let's focus a little bit on disable the Death Star. To disable the Death Star, you'd have two kind of nodes as well, two different ways to do this. One is what we call like a system failure, and the, one, the other one is mechanical failure. And a system failure is mostly like, for example, you disable the navigation system, you disable the heating system, you disable the engine system, you disable in such a way these core critical systems that they might cause like a chain reaction in the other systems and, and like shut down the Death Star. Or you can cause some sort of sort of mechanical failure, and then it can cause some problem on the hardware itself. And the hardware can cause, um, again, another kind of chain reaction that's gonna cause the whole Death Star to shut down, right? Cool, so how would you accomplish these things? And if, if the persistent failure, you need to compromise a critical IT system. And for the mechanical failure, you need to overload the critical infrastructure. So let's elaborate that a little bit. So this, there are many systems run inside the Death Star, right? And they manage the, like some sort of critical infrastructure. So if you have access, if an attacker has access to this kind of systems, they can do some damage. But usually the system protects against like um, problematic parameters or problematic variables or any dangerous kind of uh, action. So what you want to do is what an attacker needs to do, not only have access to these systems, they need to compromise so they can bypass these kind of protections to cause a system failure. When it comes like to mechanical failure, you might overload some critical infrastructure. So you might overload the heating system somehow. And to overload the heating system, you need um, you might cause all the hardware to have problems, right? Or you can cause like the dev startup to be uh, very uncomfortable to stay with and people need to leave the, the ship. So there are different ways you can do that. But the interesting thing is, regardless if you're trying to compromise the critical IT system or overload the critical infrastructure, you need to have access to the internal network. 
That's no other way. So either to like have access to sensitive areas of the Death Star, you need to have this kind of action, uh, you need to have this kind of privilege, or to compromise a critical IT system, you need to be inside the network so you can interact with the system, right? Um, and it's an internal network because if you think about it, Death Star is just a weapon, right? It's not like they make their system public so people can access. They are not a service, right? They are a weapon. And as a weapon, they hide everything as much as they can. So in order to get like um, privilege access, you need to be inside the internal network. Anything that's public is probably like not very, um, not very important and segregated from the other internal network. And in order to get access to the internal network, you need to be inside the Death Star. There is no other way. And then again, uh, Death Star is a weapon and they don't expose my systems to, to the outside world. Uh, and they segregated that stuff very well. So you need to be inside the Death Star. So maybe you can go to a server room or steal some kind of like a employee badge or biometrics or whatever. So in order to get your privilege access. The interesting thing is we could go in more detail and like, how would you get physical access to the Death Star? But as I said before, the Death Star has 1 million crew, right? Like it's very likely that an attacker like Princess Leia is, is going to be able to do that. Even if that's not true, another attacker that we have is an internal attacker. So it might be a person who actually has rights to be inside the Death Star and then inside the Death Star, they try to do something malicious. So we're going to stop this part of the attack tree here and go to the next step. So that's what we have so far. So uh, we have like take the Death Star out of, out of action. You have uh, disable the Death Star and then you have um, system failure and mechanical failure and so on and so forth. But this is only one part of the death of the attack trees, right? We have the other one where you want to destroy the Death Star. So how would you do that? How would you destroy the Death Star? And there are basically two ways to do this. One is big military attack. The Death Star is a big weapon. It's a huge weapon. It can cause a lot of damage. But also, um, it's too vulnerable to kind of um, military attacks. So yeah, that's a way to do it. And there is another way that you figure out on the, on the tread modeling and you were like so proud that you actually got that. There is a reactor inside the Death Star. In the very core of the Death Star, there's a reactor which controls everything and provides energy for the whole, uh, for the whole ship. But the reactor is very, very uh, hot. So it needs to like um, send this, this heat to the space. And the way to do that, they build like ventilation tunnels that go from the core straight to the, to the ship, to the uh, top of the ship. So then the heat can dissipate, right? But this is also a vulnerability because now we have a straight uh, path to the core and the core is very unstable. So anything that goes there, any kind of explosion can cause a chain reaction that's going to explode the whole Death Star, right? So it's a really big problem in case an attacker can exploit this. But there are some sort of a protection, let's say this. The first one is um, obscurity, right? The, um, this kind of port is not very, like, you need to know where the port is, from, for one. The Death Star is huge, and there is no easy way for, for an attacker from outside to know where they should hit. And second, the port is very small. It's only two meters wide. So it's really hard for any kind of pilot to send a, a shoot, a sh uh, send a bomb over there. So it's not like it's very likely that to happen, but still not really great. Um, so in order to destroy the reactor, you need to shoot to the thermal port. And to shoot at the thermal port, you need to know where the port is, right? So you need to obtain the Death Star plans. You need somehow know what the port, what, what the port is so you can go there and shoot it. Right? And that's the second piece of the attack trees. So together with uh, the first part of the attack tree and the second part of the attack tree, that's what we found out about the, the main problems with the Death Star design or the procedures we have at the moment. 
And these are the main goals uh, the attacker can try to accomplish. So if you get access to privilege, privilege access to network, that's going to be a problem. They have like uh, different ways where they can accomplish the disablement of the Death Star. A military attack, really huge, but something that a rebellion can pull out. Like, uh, so if you're not prepared, the rebellion can try to destroy the Death Star by a huge military attack. And finally, the thermal port. If somehow an attacker can uh, shoot the thermal port, that cause a chain reaction and then can destroy the reactor and the Death Star altogether. That's good. So that was part of, uh, of the threat modeling and then you figure out some threats. Um, and the, pro the way I like it, why I like it at Tech Trees is because it's a problem solving exercise. And everyone in IT has this kind of mindset of problem solving. We have a problem and try to solve it. That's how we do, right? That's how we operate. But rather than like use this to build stuff, now we have changed the mindset. And say so like, now rather than use your problem solve to build, you're going to use your problem solving skills to attack. And that's really, really powerful to get this kind of people, usually don't think about attackers or attacks at all, thinking about these things. And it's interesting to see how they can find vulnerabilities on their own design. And it's very interesting as well because they are collaborating on the session. When you need to go back to them and say, hey, remember the vulnerability we found, we need to fix it. They already know the contest. They were there. Maybe they, they were the ones who found out uh, anyway. And they are the ones who know to fix it uh, easily as well. So it's a really interesting exercise. And it's really, really powerful the way we can get people who never think like uh, about attackers try to think like this. It makes them think they look at their system in a very different way. And they only can cause good things because they need to fix the problems and make the system more secure. Cool. Now you have identified the risks and the threats. So now we need to mitigate those. And the first risk we need to mitigate is privilege access to the internal network. And the impact, impact for that is high. If an attacker actually manages to do this, it can be really problematic for the empire. The likelihood we put as a medium, because it's not very easy, you need to be inside the Death Star, but the Death Star and the network of the Death Star is not very secure. The rebellion has been uh, have been hacking um, the Galactic Empire for many years, but you are a good security professional, aren't you? So you come up with some uh, measures that you can implement in the network, some quick wins, some testing, and then you like to harden the network and make it a lot harder for the attacker from to get like a privileged access to this. So after this work has been done you actually manage to improve like the likelihood from medium to low. The impact is too high though, like it's really hard to make sure the impact is going to go down, but at least you make it very, it's, it's unlikely that's going to happen. Um, next one. The next one is a military attack, right? Uh, and then again, the impact is really high. If a uh, rebellion can pull, uh, can pull out an attack, then can destroy the Death Star, that's really, really high impact, but the likelihood is also high. Why is that? Because if you were Princess Leia and you get to know that your biggest adversary has such a big weapon, you probably want to go and try to attack them first, right? But there is a few things you can do to mitigate that risk. The first thing is you need to uh, come up with ways for the crew to respond to attacks very easily, very efficiently, right? So you define the run books, you make sure people, um, they tr keep it on the, on the, on the call and keep on training and keep like, make sure this exercise has been running. So when the actual thing, real thing comes, the response works very well. But not only that, the Death Star is going to need some support, right? So that's why you get like a Star Destroyers. Star Destroyers are like very big, other big ships of the Galactic Empire. And if they are close by when the Death Star is being attacked, they can provide really helpful and strong support and probably make like less likely of the um, rebellion to attack the Death Star when they have like a strong support as the Star Destroyers. And finally, you do not try to monitor the rebellion activities, right? If they try to pull out that kind of attack, it's a huge movementation. 
and they need to talk to so many different people and a lot of coordination. So if you get some sort of signal out of them and then you interpret that, you can prepare before they actually pull out the attack. So you'll be a lot more prepared when they come. So for this, you manage to get impact from high to medium because even if the rebellion tries to attack with a strong military attack, you'll be a lot well prepared and maybe you can either defeat them or at least have buy enough time to get the Death Star out of that. So that's a, a good outcome. And the likelihood is also medium because if the rebellion cannot actually destroy the Death Star, they are most likely not try to attack. They only go for the victory, right? So if the victory is not certain, they'll probably not be able to do it. But regardless, you need to be prepared, prepared, and then that's what you did. Very well done. And finally, shoot at the thermal port. And the impact, again, is high as the other risks. If somebody managed to shoot at the thermal port, you destroy the reactor, you destroy the Death Star. And the likelihood was low. And you didn't like how this outcome was low. And why is that? People are saying the likelihood is low because you need to know what the, where the port is. And even if you do, it's a really difficult and hard shot, right? So you wanted to do a little bit more. You want to do some sort of protections. Uh, and maybe cause like if an attacker is coming, just close down the door or open different ones or have different levels of protection. You try to argue for that. But remember, I was talking in the beginning, the project was being delayed for so many years already. The budget is being like uh, over uh, for, for many years as well. So the business didn't want to like go back to the design, redesign the kind of ports to make sure it's more secure and then implement it. That delayed the project for a few more years. And so the business decided to accept the race. So, but yet, you, you're going to try to do something, right? So at least you're going to try to hide the Death Star plans. So if the, one of the things they need to do in order to shoot at the thermal port, they need to know where the port is. So if at least you try to hide it and make it harder for the attack, an attacker finds out about the Death Star plan, uh, about, sorry, about the Death Star port, then it wouldn't be a problem anymore. All right. Oh, at least you will mitigate to a certain level. That's the only thing you could have done. So you did. And then you went your own with your life, right? Uh, you did the best you could. Then you fit, you look at different other areas of the security of the galactic empire and you hope for the best. And then eventually the Death Star has been released and the Death Star has been like a, a, a cause of a joy for the empire. They cause lots of trouble for the Galactic Empire, and that happened. The Death Star was destroyed, which is not a good outcome for anyone in the Galactic Empire. But you are a professional, right? So what you do in that situation? Forensic analysis. So you try to figure out what went wrong, how the Rebellion managed to destroy such an important weapon. And the answer is this guy, Luke Skywalker. He was the one who managed to shoot the thermal port. But there's some interesting things about Luke Skywalker. The first thing is, he's a Jedi. Which is interesting because they are supposed to be hiding, not actually attacking the Empire. Hmm. And they're like, before he actually managed to shoot at the, at the thermal port, he was being, he was about to be shut down, but the person who actually helped Luke Skywalker was a bounty hunter. He came up at the last minute and saved Luke from, from being destroyed, and then Luke managed to shoot at the thermal port. Which is interesting because bounty hunters only help, they only work for money, right? They don't organize themselves very well, so why are bounty hunters helping a Jedi? Hmm. There is another thing that's quite interesting is Luke Skywalker is actually Princess Leia's brother, which makes him like a high level ranking rebellion official too. So he's not only a Jedi, he's a, um, a rebellion uh, official. So, yes, interesting. And the worst part of it all, 
the worst part. <laughs> Luke Skywalker is the son of your boss, right? Which makes this whole a lot more complicated because Luke Skywalker is considered an internal attacker now? You don't know. But definitely like not your problem and you don't have a good feeling about it, right? Um, that's a problem for your boss to take care of his family and his own boss. Um, but yeah, Luke Skywalker is definitely a problem and he, he was the one who managed to pull the shot. But how Luke Skywalker actually managed to find out about the port, right? And the answer is these two people here. They managed to hack the Galactic Empire and get the plants. And you did a good job. You put your, like, behind that, the Death Star plants in a very secure location, at least the most secure you had in the Galactic Empire. So these two people managed to go to this location, hack into the data centers, stole the hard drive, and then send the copy of it to the rebellion. You know what's worse? The worst thing about that is there was no encryption arrest. So they only got a copy of the hard drive and sent to the rebellion. It's not really good. Um, but that's how they did it. So they stole the plans, they sent the plans to the rebellion. The rebellion quickly attacked the Death Star and for a miracle, they managed to shoot to the terminal port and everything was destroyed, right? Well, I wish good luck for you because now you need to deliver your report for the forensic analysis to your boss. Um, good luck. Now let's talk a little bit about lessons learned, right? Lessons learned of this story. And the interesting thing is, uh, I use this analogy where uh, you found out about the problem of the thermal port at the very end of the design, at the very end of the building of the software, at the very end, like before going to production. And then there's a problem that happens ev like in all companies. You find a secure problem at the very end, and then you need to fix it, but nobody wants to fix it before release to production. So trend modeling is something that if you, if you have, should do early and often. So in the case of the Death Star, if you have done like the trend modeling at the design level, and people are about like designing the Death Star and come up with the design of the thermal port, you could have seen, uh, seen it or someone by from your team seeing the problem and then you fix the design right there. It's a lot cheaper to fix at the design level or the beginning of, of, of the construction or in case of software, beginning of the coding than actually at the very end, right? And there's a problem that happens all the time. So if you want to do trend modeling, do early and do often because things change, right? Especially for software. Change all the time. We pivot. We try. We implement new features. We scope certain features. So we need to look at that a certain like um, amount of time. There are always unknowns, right? Um, in this case, like Luke Skywalker was a very unknown. He was at least three different personas, right? Um, so even though you have trend modeling and have covered some of the risks, you always need to think about it that you might have not seen something, or there's some sort of information that you don't have it or the attacker can act in a very different way. So it's not because you have done threat modeling means you're secure. It means you cover some of the, the worst threats, but that doesn't mean you are very secure. So you still need to do some work on top of it. Threat modeling is just the beginning. And finally, threat modeling must be engaging. And then again, uh, if people go to a meeting that's very boring and they don't like it, and it's complicated or it's on a checkbox. They don't engage. If they don't engage, they don't collaborate. If they don't collaborate, you don't have the magic of the trend modeling. The trend modeling doesn't work as well, uh, as good as they would if people are engaging. So in this case, I have been using factories. I, I think it's been very successful um, where I have been done it, but it doesn't need, doesn't need to be a factories. Regardless of what you do for trend modeling, you need to make sure that people involved they are engaging, they are, they're engaged, they, they, they have a good time and they see value on it so they can keep coming back and keep doing the, the exercises over and over again. Cool, that's all what I had to talk about today. Thank you very much. May the first be with you.